Okay, it's 5.05. We can stop with the small talk and start with the sex talk. Um, welcome everyone to this very exciting event that we are, uh, we at Lux Magazine are co-hosting with M plus one. We're really excited uh, to present in conversation Liza, Liza Featherstone, Ariella Thornhill, and Sophie Lewis. Uh, my name is Natalie Adler. I'm one of the editors at Lux Magazine, and we are really excited to present a conversation on collective pleasure. So um, our panelists joining us here tonight, um, Ariella Thornhill is the author of uh, the upcoming book, Socialist Sex Ed. She is a member of the board of Lux Jacobin Magazine and is on the board of directors for Verso Books. Sophie Lewis is a writer based in Philadelphia, a member of the faculty at Visser, the Brooklyn Institute, and the author of Full Surrogacy Now, which came out in 2019 from Verso. And you can follow her online on Twitter and Patreon at Repro Utopia. And um, oh, I just realized I didn't I didn't grab your bio. I didn't grab your bio, Liza. Oh, I put it in the Google Doc um, um, for the, but I can, you want it oh, in. got it. Sorry, sorry. All right. Liza Featherstone is a columnist at Jacobin Magazine and longtime contributing writer for The Nation. So very excited to talk to all of you this evening. And again, this is a joint production of N Plus One Magazine and Lux Magazine, uh, which is a new feminist, socialist feminist glossy. N Plus One giving us the cultural criticism we all know and love. Uh, and we're gonna drop some subscription links in the chat for both, just in case you haven't gotten your hot little hands on either hard copies of these wonderful magazines. Please subscribe. All right. So just to launch right into this, you know, we had been so um, interested in putting all of you in conversation because these essays that you wrote, Liza and Sophie, and the conversation you had with um, Sarah Leonard, uh, Ariella, you know, we had really been thinking about this question of better sex under socialism, um, how to experience pleasure, how to think outside of um, capitalist strictures when we think about pleasure, desire, um, boundaries, lust, all of these things, eros. So I was thinking that all of these essays, conversations, ideas, they all are rotating around eros and collective and a, and a love for the collective. So. Just to, just to kick us off, I mean, the obvious thing to state would be that we have gone through an ongoing pandemic experience. It's changed how we think about contact. It's changed how we think about collectivity. All three of you touch on it in your work. And I was wondering if you could maybe like just start us off by thinking about where longing or longing for connection and communication might have existed in your work here that you've presented for us. Um, is it something that um, you think you might have experienced while writing, while seeing your work go out in the world? Um, any thoughts on that? Maybe you want to kick us off, Liza? Oh, wow. Um, that's a really big and great question. Um, and, um, and yeah, I think, um, I, I, I think that I did, um, I, I started this essay, um, before the pandemic, um, and, um, and, and, but did most of the work during, and I think, I, I think definitely, um, a sense of, um, of loss, um really um, infused it i i felt a, a i mean i i felt a, a loss of 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 general um the the arrows of just um day-to-day -day connection with um my friends and um and with humans in general and um but but also 
of the collective because we were really cut off from 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 public life uh, as as well. Um, so I, I think I mean so I wrote for people just tuning in. I wrote about um, Alexandra Kolontai, who is um, um, a um, Bolshevik theorist um, who we would characterize now as a feminist and also as a communist, um, obviously. Um, and, um, and we would also now um, characterize her as a free lover. Um, and, um, and I think that, um, yes, yeah, certainly um, her, um, as, um, as, as Jody Dean said in a lecture about her, Alexandra Kollontai teaches us to see that our um, our most intimate experiences are collective, and I think that that was certainly um, all the more um, acute um, as I as I wrote this in um, spring and summer of of, of twenty twenty, um, as we were all increasingly isolated from each other. Mm. Ariella, you want to take this one? Sure. So um, what was fascinating for me um, during the pandemic was seeing the ways that people explored the issue of social connectivity and the way it can regulate and dysregulate the body, like the actual physical body. So a lot of studies came out around touch, what touch does, how touch changes your um, biochemistry, your hormonal responses, and it resonated a lot with some things that I was reading about hormones. You know, there's this kind of myth that a lot of kids are taught, like there's the male hormone, the female hormone, and they do X, Y, and Z. Um, but the more research you go into, the more you see that hormones are social and that hormones and, and biological regulation are, are also socially responsive and that the most profound aspect of them is that they allow for socially responsive, socially adaptive physical responses. So when people started studying uh, this kind of lack of connection coming out of the pandemic, it was touching on a lot of things that I had been researching. Um, and my book is like a kid, it's, it's for kids. Um, <laughs> but I get into some heady concepts like, you know, um, socialized housing, for instance, because there is an aspect of connection that relies on public and private space and the delineation and the right to each thing. And in America, we've had a crisis of alienation um, for much longer than the pandemic. And it's felt by people, usually on a class gradient, what public space do you have access to when like public areas become um, sort of turned into a commodity form, right? So the heyday of this would be the mall, but even the mall had public space that you could wander into and like, you know, hang out with your friends and sit by a fountain and not buy anything. And I think everyone who's ever been a teenager is familiar with the kind of the lust to carve a public and a private space for yourself, especially because teenagers typically can't own property. And so, you know, they go behind the gas station or the CVS or in where I grew up, it was like a gravel pit. There was like an experimental forest that people called the boob where all the trees turned in and they would meet in these areas and, and, you know, there's something really primal and fundamental about the need to carve out that space. And it's not just belonging. It's not just lust. It's not just being able to, you know, like make out or fulfill certain types of desires. It's also being part of a social body that's regulating itself, a collective that's regulating itself. And that's happening on the biological level. And I hope that coming out of the pandemic, the lesson there isn't lost because we don't have a country that values or develops that type of space. And we can see examples, historical and contemporary examples of, you know, assuring the right to private space, you know, for instance, through rent control would be one mechanism, um, but also ensuring the right to a safe public space. Um, and I think that 
we have seen how profoundly people can be affected by the loss of both of those things. But we need to kind of combine that narrative and then relate it to a broader set of like biological needs because loneliness is a, a kind of illness. So is overstimulation. A person can be dysregulated by being in a, too public of an environment and not having private areas. Um, we have to think about like where and how intimacy happens and, and there's a broader conversation. If you want to explore yourself and your identity sexually, you probably need some private space to do that and some public space. So I have been fascinated and a little bit saddened by the narrative around that that came out of the pandemic because I want it to be broader. And I think that there's a class of people who have been denied that. And I think, you know, teenagers are great to look to because they don't care. I was about to swear, I don't know if I can swear in the broadcast. <laughs> they don't care. They will do whatever it takes. We've seen an apparatus, a state apparatus come up around in part how teenagers loiter places. Like they radically, kind of aggressively assert these rights, including their right to privacy, slamming the door in your face, you know. I think that we have like a lot to take from that, a lot to apply it to. I hope that for socialists and leftists, we don't just kind of um, silo that to a result of the pandemic and we see that it's a kind of broader set of needs that we have to meet and plan around. I'm gonna pick up on that thread on the public and the private space later on too. Yeah, Sophie. Hi, um, I'm speaking to you from uh, Lenny Lenape land, Philadelphia. Um, my longing um, in relation to the erotic and the octopus piece that I wrote uh, kind of, um, you know, by happenstance in response to a response to an idle um, Twitter thread that I, that I um, just put out there pleasurably because I was turned on by an octopus documentary. Um, is actually linked and perhaps better expressed or more straightforwardly expressed in a different essay I wrote earlier for a Mal journal about um, the possibility of um, a collective turn on um, because I you know I do think it's important um, to and, and all of the speakers that I'm lucky to be here on a panel with today do this very well to keep things kind of structural right like sex positivity is a is a sort of dreadful kind of discourse if it is voluntaristic yeah. or somehow you know uh, prescriptive uh, of the individual you know asexual liberation is perhaps the core of sexual liberation if you like you know I was I'm grateful to people who have kind of um, pulled me up a bit on not engaging sufficiently with um, a very kind of uh, strongly emerging kind of um, discourse, particularly among, you know, people who are a bit younger than me, uh, because I'm no longer maybe the youngest kind of, you know, member of the left or whatever, which in my head perhaps I saw us. But there's a sense, I think, of really needing to stress kind of, um, you know, a asexual kind of um, uh, pleasure, if that makes sense. That's not a contradiction, right? You know, my, I wanted to hold up this pillow to summarize my basic point and, uh, you know, be a slut, do whatever you want is my, is my longing, but the conditions of possibility for that uh, include uh, refusal, right? The, 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 the conditions of possibility for saying, I would prefer not to meaningfully are the same you know, conditions in which um, a, a truly kind of communist, um, you know, erotics would flourish. Um, and, uh, you know, before it became tethered to uh, rather kind of automationist um, forms of accelerationism, the phrase um, communal luxury or uh, luxury communism was actually one that was developed um, by someone called Judy Thorne and others um, in Manchester in England um, on a tumbler that was essentially just um, a collection of um, evocations of communal bathing um, and architectural um, biomes that would um, foster um, uh, pleasure, 
in, in all its diversity, you know? <laughs> um, and so that's the kind of longing that I um, have, you know, held within myself in, in all of these pieces. And I just want to note before um, handing the mic over again, that it, it very much kind of predates COVID, right? You know, I, I won't, I agree very much with Liza that there's a loss, right? There's a sense of kind of uh, shrinking of possibility. Um, but we can't, we can't just blame COVID, right? People have wanted to do so. And there have been really hideous op-eds, you know, including in, um, you know, LGBT kinds of magazines, um, urging uh, the, the population uh, to, uh, to cultivate self-respect, quote unquote, during this pandemic, ergo, you know, uh, keep uh, your pants zipped, right? This is literally quoting <laughs> from The Blade. Um, and, you know, that, that is, that is uh, basically straightforwardly, um, you know, an echo of the AIDS crisis and the kinds of, um, you know, the, 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 the collective fear um, that, that is actively sort of stoked and, and enjoyed in and of itself um, of the figure of the vagrant and the promiscuous, um, you know, queer. Uh, and of course, it's, it's upside down because, you know, if there is one population with a really strong understanding of contact tracing um, and a really in-depth understanding of risk, it is promiscuous, self-respecting queer people, right? Um, and of course, you know, the, the, the institutions of private property and capital accumulation come first in our understanding of what, you know, of what is essential. And we don't think about weddings when we think about, um, you know, super spreader events so much in the public discourse as we do kind of, um, you know, people fucking uh, promiscuously somehow that seems that seems worse, right, to the public imaginary. So I am, I, I long for an erotics that is inseparable from the destruction of private property um, and uh, the private nuclear household. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, why why are there not more thing pieces about you know the the dangers of weddings and fewer about the dangers of random hookups during the pandemic? If we really want to talk about uh, super spreader events, um, and always good to note that you know we are on the cusp of May, which means it's almost June, which means we need to gird ourselves for the forthcoming Pride Month, uh, kink shaming tweet storms of you know, that doesn't belong in pride. So always worthwhile thinking about um, public and private space in terms of queerness and queer desire. Yeah, so, and just to tie up some threads here, you know, even as you all wrote about collectivity and collective experiences, you were all also discussing boundaries um, and this push and pull between longing for collectivity and staying apart from one another as we've been experiencing this past year plus. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit more about um, the role of boundaries as well. Um, and we, let's start with Ariella. In your interview, you spoke about teaching children boundaries around consent as a way of granting children more power. And I was really interested in thinking about boundaries as a source to draw power. And in general, anytime anyone enables a child to be able to say no to something I, I like. So if you could talk a little bit more about that. Sure, so yeah, my approach is, is largely about kind of mapping out the um, ability of kids, of minors to make decisions about their health. And I think that we focus a lot on um, the rights and the ability of adults to do that. And we've introduced to kids a kind of legalistic consent script now um, in the wake of Me Too that is being integrated into sex education. Um, but we don't have a system that allows kids to really have boundaries about their health, about who helps them with it, um, how it's managed. And part of that is just, um, well, there, there are two big sides, private insurance, <laughs> um, the lack of universal health care, right? And federalism. So each state has different rights that minors have. So in some states, a minor can have the right to an abortion if they're legally a runaway, 
which you know requires a, a a kind of experience that would classify them as that that's pretty horrifying to think through um and the same is true we've seen with these kind of high profile attacks on trans kids and their rights and their right to make decisions over their own bodies and um their expression and their health so uh one thing that i do in the book is just tell kids you know here are your medical rights and i think that uh Adults aren't told that enough, to be honest, um, but it's certainly helpful to tell a child, like, you are the one in control here. You get to say who is doing what to you and who that person is. And if you don't like them, you can tell them to leave. I think that uh, very often the, the kind of consent script that kids are given neglects the fact that they are extremely powerless in a lot of situations and um, fails to describe to them why that's the case. So, you know, it's one thing to say, oh, you, you can say yes or no to one or another sex acts with a person. It's another to say, in this instance, legally, your parent can override your desire to have this medical procedure or not have this medical procedure. There are a lot of other places that do tackle this with kids. So uh, in the Netherlands, a child under 16 can get an abortion with the consent of a doctor if they don't want to seek consent from their parents. That's one way of kind of mitigating this. Um, but I think that we have a long way to go. And to me, I feel like there has been a, um, a hyper focus on certain types of boundary setting. Um, particularly for uh, a, a society that's kind of grasping at straws to figure out how we manage this sea change after Me Too. And it neglects other kinds of healthy ways of boundary setting that kids kind of naturally do. Like I used to be a teacher and I would watch kids at the playground and they're kind of like little psychopaths. <laughs> like they, they, they have no notion of like, you know, many, many social rules that, that other people have. Right. So like they just bite each other. I saw a kid get mad at a nonverbal kid and just start choking the kid and shaking him and being like, why won't you talk to me? He was too. But the other kids are like, hey, stop doing that, right? There's a kind of social regulation that happens that's a natural part of the way that people learn and model behavior after each other. And so I think the other side of, of the consent conversation is I really want kids to be able to know what they consent to and what they can consent to um, or assent to in a medical situation. Um, but I also, want to expand the scope, talk about what um, the environment in, in which consent takes place. You know, as Sophie said, the ability to say, confidently say no to something, the ability to confidently say like, I like this way. Um, I think that we create these spaces for kids to learn that, right? So we create public schools, we have models, um, that create a type of educational play. I think all play is educational. So we do that up to a point, right? Like it's fine for kids to get together on a playground and then one kid bites another kid and then all the other kids are like, hey, stop doing that. Like <laughs> it's alienating and you just hurt your friend, right? But when it comes to sex, we don't have spaces for low stakes play. We don't have a type of low stakes interaction. and to essentially uh, channel all of the kind of education for that aspect of life into this broadened consent model means that while you may be hearing good or better stories about your rights and your ability to draw the line, the space in which you practice that is extremely risky still. Um, the ways in which you communicate that can still be alienating. You can still be judged for those things. And the consequences of sexual interactions and sexual encounters can be devastating. Um, so, yeah, I think there's, you know, a bunch of nested ways that um, 
boundaries are interacting. And I try to do my best to kind of tease those out, um, but also say, you know, everyone's learning them together. The more we make a low stakes way to do that, the more we broaden the social conversation so that it's not just, you know, somebody lecturing you and scolding you about what the boundaries should be and how you should assert them, the more we kind of um, allow for the dynamic that kids and adults naturally have, which is like learning and experiencing through play, um, the more we can build in some kind of low stakes um, situations and lower the stakes of all interaction the better it will be for people to be able to say no the easier and the easier it is to say yes and to robustly say yeah i love that i know i like that because i had the time to learn about myself or i did this with another person i think the best part of you know sex and sexual exploration is that it's a type of physical empathy it is a way of profoundly connecting to others and i i think that you can't be empathetic without a boundary. <laughs> and that applies to physical empathy and emotional empathy. Yeah, just to know that someone else is, is not you and to respect that even as the most fundamental of boundaries. Yeah. So, Liza, you opened your essay with the New York City Health Department's recommendation from last summer to use the six feet apart mandate as an opportunity to to get kinky, which was indeed what the, the you know the health department suggested that you do to get creative. It was. How so? How do you make the connection between how'd you go from glory holes to the state to Colin Tai? Walk us through. Walk us through that. Well. Yeah, so this was a really, this was really funny, and I should say, unfortunately, I don't um, know that a lot of people follow these guidelines, um, but, um, but the, the New York City Health Department um, um, said, you know, in, and this was at a time when people were very, um, people were, people were very fearful, reasonably so, it was a pandemic, um, a lot of um, there was a lot of uh, uh, there was a lot of shaming of people even for gathering with their friends in the park um, you know much and and there was there was certainly a lot of shaming of people um, um, getting together for sex um, and the government um, issued this sober document um, um, saying um, you know it was okay to have sex and um and their their suggestion was to get a little kinky um and um and you know they and they offered and they they offered a lot of different um practical strategies um for sex without um with minimal infection risk and um and and to me um um i i thought what one of the things that was so um sort of sweet about it was that um was that uh you know it it was um it it was this um rare moment of um of a government body um you know saying hey you know we know you need this you know we know you need this intimacy and sex and, and you know and fun in your life and um and we've thought about you know how it might work um and um and and this was um you know as i was um right in the as i was immersed in uh, alexandra kalantai's um writings i i i thought oh this is a, this is exactly what she's up to um she's re uh, really thinking through what would be the conditions um, under which we could seek pleasure, you know, under which we we, we could um, safely and happily um, seek pleasure. So, it was sort of a rare um, moment um, from our um, um, from 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 our modern government. And then, Sophie, the boundaries in your essay might be a little bit more obvious as you were writing about creatures of different species but you also talk about desire for communication versus fear of 
contamination that I found really interesting. And the same kind of contamination that Liza was mentioning just now and thinking about like staying safe during COVID and safe play and things like that. I also really enjoyed thinking about uh, fear of wetness and sea creatures as a fear of bodily fluids and, and illness. Um, so where do you, where were you finding boundaries um, in your exploration of the octopus teacher? I mean, it's, uh, it's in the text of the film a lot. Um, it's, it's explicitly part of the, um, the spoken observations of the, uh, uh, the octopus boyfriend, um, or uh, student, sorry. Um, I mean, as we know, uh, there can never be anything erotic about a teacher. <laughs> no, we've, no one's ever had a crush on their teacher before or made porn about that. But the boundary um, of species is, is troubled explicitly again and again. You know, he, um, the, uh, and I, I like this guy. I, I am entirely identified with him, you know, <laughs> like um, with including with his struggle to kind of come to grips with, with, with his, uh, his feelings. I'm not sure I would have done any better. You know, I would have been just as much of a bro about it. Like, ah, oh my God, this is incredible. Oh no. And then, you know, referring to her as an it just to kind of put up the boundary again. But he says the same exact words, um, the boundary disappears, you know, that in fact, um, the um, shell diver, who was then um, translated as fisherman's wife in the very famous Hokusai painting, um, you know, the dream of the fisherman's wife, uh, which was interpreted, you know, in Europe as a scene of rape. Um, but in fact, you know, she's very, clearly to me having a fantastic time um and you know she, she's she's got two octopuses um making her orgasm and you can see the orgasm in the text it's it says um oh 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 boundaries dissolve right so i mean i was just noticing things you know just noticing um but boundaries are you know simultaneously what makes sex sexy um and you know that which need to be called into called into question at the same time for the erotic to come into being, um, and you know boundarylessness um, is is not um, erotic uh, per se. You know um, it's intimation, uh, the sort of asymptotic kind of curve towards it is what is erotic. I think um, boundaries are constructs, right? <laughs> um, you know, which is what's scary um, about them. You know, we want to naturalize them. And even a species boundary, um, you know, is, is to some extent a, a construct. You know, the, um, you know, I don't want to get too into the weeds here, but, you know, um, the human body is full of um, non-human organisms. You know, the, the, the fact that, uh, I mean, and, and I'm not at all, you know, disputing, uh, on the contrary, kind of everything Ariella said about, you um, you know, the, the property that is one's body, right? This is a sort of anti propertarian concept of property in the body that has been theorized beautifully um, by, by queer and, and black feminists, right? Who, who um, you know, you can read Roz Pichesky, for example, on the very complex ways in which you can oppose private property while claiming uh, a notion of property in the body. Um, as a necessary part of the fight against sexual coercion, um, against rape, against um, you know patriarchal harm, and um, the, the 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 compulsion to to, to sexuality, right? The the imposed um, anti-erotic uh, capitalist um, injunction to enjoy um, and to fuck and to uh, you know just be up for things, right? Um, which is then indistinguishable and unboundaried uh, from work. You know, we can no longer tell uh, when we are working or not. So, you know, <laughs> Eros is just kind of dying a death. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm very persuaded by the calls in um, Invert Journal by Kay Gabriel for a politically urgent hedonism, right? An anti-work. Um, erotic utopianism as a matter of ecological urgency, right? The concept of erotophobia was actually developed by, you know, socialist eco-feminists, right? Um, erotophobia being this kind of uh, anxiety that becomes kind of fascist 
about um, the multitude of pleasures that are just all around us. <laughs> like, you know, taxonomies of species um, that put taboos on things like, um, you know, having sex with a lake. Uh, I didn't, so just as one example, um, you know, are, are there to kind of make sure that we can go to work, right? And like, and, and stay coupled and stay procreative and stay binary gendered. Um, you know, and multiply um, in an orderly fashion as sons and daughters and wives and husbands and so forth. And, and you know, and, and uh, you know, <laughs> the, the part of this is very much um, the reduction of all um, the many vistas of sort of liquescent, labial, um, you know, membranous sensation that is available to us, that, you know, the sense of, um, of the erotic of the sunset or a sort of thunderstorm or, you know, the smell of the road, the touch of your cat, <laughs> you know, into the, into the a sense of the erotic as, uh, you know, the, the penetrative porno mechanical act, you know, did he fuck the octopus? No one ever said that. <laughs> you know? um, by the way, she has eight arms. Um, and, you know, in terms of just the, you know, the distribution of holes and penetrable you know I, I just don't see it really as the likely outcome but this is what we we, we reduce um sex to right the the finger finger stab stab in whole um possibility and you know that is actually also very um you know it is it, very concrete you can't just kind of you know wish away that that apparatus by by critiquing it you know many of us have a very well-founded fear um, of um, you know of rape right <laughs> and, and and as I as I really do want to insist right the the art of boundarying um, in a in an I would prefer not to kind of way is is the, the core of all, of, uh, of all kind of um, you know uh, sexual politics and sexual liberation possibilities you know I um, I think uh, being able to notice one's turn off. Um, a very wise person said this to me very early on in my, um, you know, my career as a slut um, is, is, is the, you know, the, the best and, and first lesson, right? Actually noticing when you are turned off, um, because I think we, we aren't even uh, perhaps collectively um, aware of how turned off work society makes us. <laughs> okay. I'll pause there. Yeah, and that makes me think about the the question of of teaching. Like, f that's a beautifully valuable lesson, and something indeed we need to, you know, we can teach ourselves. But even just hearing the suggestion from someone else, like learn when you're you're turned off, as a way of creating your own boundaries there too, and your own no's that make sense, that make room for yeses to come, right? Um, so I wanted to ask you all too about like kind of like the role of of teaching and as somewhat a more prescriptive role in your essays. Um, I mean, Sophie, you were very critical of the idea of the octopus being Foster's teacher, right? And I was wondering if maybe you could speak to it like a way that, you know, teaching could not serve as a form of reproductive futurism and also just like not a way of like sublimating your desire into teaching as well like what's the in the the future of good sex under socialism what's the role of the teacher gosh um i don't i don't mean to contradict i don't understand myself as really that critical of the idea that the octopus is his teacher you know i, I um it, it's i was mainly poking fun at the idea that um that naming that as the only dynamic going on would somehow be a kind of um uh, a security, you know, a, um, a way of sanitizing <laughs> the uh, way to deflect from him yeah. as a lover, or the the you know, I think it, it yeah, it, it was sort of a way to make it more PG. It's very kind of um, yeah, it, it fits within a discourse of kind of wisdom received. You know, it's a spiritual kind of humbling, a self humbling posture, but um, you know. Uh, I, I meant to poke fun at, at that because obviously we have a huge canon of, um, you know, 
that kind of discourse coming into, you know, uh, quite kinky scenarios, you know, bottoming for one's teacher. I mean, you know, obviously, I, I you know, I would absolutely, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, suggest that we could talk about um, the erotics of teaching. I'm, I'm also interested in anti-hierarchical um, pedagogy, um, you know, uh, I, I, uh, perhaps this isn't quite the question um, for me. Perhaps I'll just pick up on the prescriptive bit of it. I mean, um, I do perhaps find that it's, yeah, it, it's common, uh, and it was before COVID, um, to talk very nihilistically about um, heterosexuality in particular, um, and to kind of almost put um, lesbians in particular, um, and maybe more generally queers to some extent, in the role of almost um, teacher, um, or, or dare I say almost saviour, right? This, this idea of a superior um, sexual culture, um, and, a, and this is the term that um, my, my, my collaborator and uh, <laughs> friend and teacher, Asa Sarazin, termed um, heterofatalism, um, heteronegativity, uh, in an earlier formulation, heteropessimism. Um, but what that pessimism really was, was actually um, uh, an, an, a desire not to really, um, if you like, learn or become equipped to do something about the, the sorry state um, of, of pleasure in the present, right? The, the, the heterofatalist says sort of wistfully, you know, um, to the queer, you know, oh, I wish, I wish I could be gay, but, uh, I, you know, and men are such trash and yet, you know, yet I, I am stuck in this cage. Um, and uh, I love hearing it. You should just keep saying that to us over and over and over again. Right. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, except, you know, Except I don't I really like hearing it. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we neither do you. Yeah. It. You know, it's like, it, it's sort of like, well, it, first of all, there is a very noxious culture of lesbian self-congratulation and sort of um, uh, lesbian purity and lesbian sort of, yeah, superiority politics, which doesn't need any encouraging. Um, and it leads to dangerous places. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, second, of, you know, because listen, sex is, dangerous. Um, the sexual liberationists in the 60s and 70s knew that, right? The, the misunderstanding of the sexual liberation position is somehow that there is um, in those quarters, in our, in, the, in, in, in our quarters, a kind of overlooking, um, a minimization of the pain and the, the, the harm and the violence that is so um, unavoidable <laughs> uh, in the field of sexuality, you know? earthly contingency baby getting hurt and also unfortunately yeah structural violence and 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 harm right and 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 but but sexual liberationists know that and still that we say let's go let's play let's 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 still find a way to collectively look after one another and and make one another thrillingly safe you know, in a long-term sense, not to kind of, um, not to necessarily sort of overemphasize um, uh, the, the sort of insurance policy, the, the sort of retreat, the kind of, um, the preemptive kind of um, uh, avoidance and, and um, self-protection, because, you know, there, there's so, there, life is short and there is so much to experience of so many different varieties, you know, so yes, it is earnest. And I would also argue that we are in a very, very anti-earnest moment. It is so uncool um, to be sex positive, right? Yes. I mean, massively. And I think it was partly my earnestness that kind of uh, made people so disgusted um, with my um, acid trip. Uh, to be honest and and i you know i can understand that to, to an extent it is really embarrassing <laughs> like it's you know um but okay i'm gonna shut up sorry yeah <laughs> i just want to say i loved your the earnestness and the acid trip and i thought your essay was great but i think you're right i think there is a um i think there there is a real um anti-earnestness um i mean you you see on um i mean i think you, you 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 see this in 
um, almost any internet discussion of alternative sexualities now um, that that there that there's going to be kind of um, a, a, like a mockery, uh, you know that um, the, and and that there, there's going to be kind of a um, um, a, a making fun, um, and and it's um, I mean I, th I think there's a, a a real defensiveness about the pursuit of pleasure and um, and you know and and about the um, and a kind of a hostility or suspicion toward the subcultures um, that you know a a attempt to pursue it. Erotophobia. So um, I think that we could probably agree that capitalism itself is inherently erotophobic. So let's talk a little bit about our favorite subject of how ha capitalism gets in the way of good sex. Mm -hmm. And Liza, do you wanna do you wanna lead us off? Sure. Um, I mean, I think um, that I, I talked a little bit in, about this in the Colin Tai essay. Um, I mean, she she identified. She was one of the um, earlier people to identify this. She wasn't the only Victorian theorist um, to um, to talk um, about, um, you know, the possibilities that people could um, um, could challenge the traditional um, family, that people could challenge um, monogamy, um, or that um, um, or, or that um, that women could. Um, um, could, could seek pleasure, but she was um, she she was one of the few to really identify um, the material conditions of capitalism and how they might get in the way, um, and um, and 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 I think you know we um, I, I think you know unfortunately um, that idea has aged well. I mean, you know, we, we certainly see, and Ariella touched a little bit about this in her, in her comments and also the, um, and, and a lot in the, in, in the interview with, with Sarah in Lux, um, you know, that um, ma material conditions um, of capitalism really do get in the way of pleasure if you don't have housing, if you don't have privacy, you know, if you don't have um, a place to live, if you don't have um, access to nice public space to flirt and hang out, um, you know, and um, and if um, um, and you know, as, um, as 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 Sophie touched on, you know, our um, our culture of of work, like the I mean, the the sense that you know that you know everything at all times we really should be working and being productive. Um, and um, and you know Eros is just totally um, at odds with that. I would also kind of add, um, and you know this is sort of, you know um, when when you read stuff written in Colin Tai's time, the um, the culture of um, of consumerism was almost kind of innocent. You know back then it was just kind of getting started. But I think like now. Um, I think it's I think it's a more of an insidious source of erotophobia in a way that um, that you know we're um, we're we're kind of we're we're conditioned to um, to work and um, re and and to work enough that we can reward ourselves with um, pleasure that is expensive. <laughs> you know, as opposed to, you know, like sex is free, you know, be, like being fucked by a lake is free, <laughs> you know, go, going in like, you, you know, um, like, and, you know, um, communing with the birds in the park is free, you know, I mean, the, like that, it, I mean, in, in some ways, there's a lot of, um, there's, there's, um, there's a lot of capitalist interest in alienating us from um from so many of the um the pleasures in, in our in our life you know i mean i i was like um um I was talking to somebody the other day and he was who who was like well we still can't really do anything 
you know, um, until the kids are vaccinated. I was like, what do you mean you can't do anything? Um, and, um, and he was like, well, like, because we can't travel. I was like, who cares? Like, like, why do you need to get on a plane? <laughs> like, there are just so many things you can do. You know what I mean? But like, it's just like, 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 you know, like, r ranging from, you know, you, you could go get fucked by a lake, <laughs> you know, whatever, like, like, but the idea that, like, I mean, I, I think that we, I, I think people are um, very, um, very conditioned to, um, to be kind of almost on a on a treadmill of you know pleasure is a reward for work um, and so like so it has to be you know something um, it it has to be something expensive and I think there's like almost an inherent erotophobia in that you know like whereas like you know um, it would be a lot more um, ecological and economical to take three hours out of your work day and go see your lover. Um, but like, that's like, th like, that's not um, as socially acceptable, you know, as like, you know, taking your family on a, you know, earth destroying plane to go somewhere, <laughs> you know? I mean, it's just like, I don't mean to be too judgmental about that, but uh, like, but, uh, but I'm just, I'm just saying there's like a, um, I, I think I, th I think there's um there there's a there's a lot of um that there's a lot of erotophobia at the at the heart of of capitalist alienation um at, that isn't even um anticipated by these early um Bolsheviks Bolshevik texts. Do we think that there is erotophobia on the left amongst us and our comrades? Yes. Yeah, I mean, where do we find that? How do we fight that? How do we show our comrades the way? I'm, I'll dabble, I'll dabble into this question. <laughs> 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 and it seems like, uh, well, hopefully it doesn't uh, alienate the audience too much, but I'm looking at you guys now. Um, I think that there's there's a couple things going on. One is that um, we have a kind of neoliberalism that locates potential social change in the individual. And you see this a lot with um, other charged subjects, right? Gender, race sexual orientation. So there's been a popular notion of anti-racism that's if you look inward, question your habits, prejudices, behaviors, emotions, and feelings, and then change them, um, you will create a society that is um, more racially equitable. And there is some value to understanding and removing bias. But what I think happens quite often is that interventions typically go along that line. So they look at individual behavior, thoughts, feelings, and actions, and then offer a solution in modifying that. Um, but no individual modification can change uh, structural inequalities. So. I love that there's a movement to destigmatize certain things. I love that there's a movement to destigmatize all manner of, you know, um, understanding and engaging with pleasure and desire, but also, you know, uh, some of the consequences of that, right? Like, if you choose to get an abortion, that shouldn't be stigmatized. It's a medical decision you've made. Carry on. It's great that people are saying, you know, we can shamelessly discuss and be open about these things. That, however, does not address all of the hundreds of millions of people who don't have access to that service. So I think often like, and I, and I don't want to, I think there is a socialist <laughs> impulse that we can dig out of this creepy, hyper-atomized, uh, neoliberal, <laughs> 
focus on individual psychology, which is that we do want to live in a world where the collective creates the social structure, right? We, that, that would be an expression of democracy where the thoughts and feelings of people have some recourse to their society and make up that. But we don't, we just don't, right? So I think sometimes on the left, people can overemphasize destigmatization um, and say, you know, like, do you, we fully embrace you is wonderful, it's wonderful, but it doesn't go far enough towards addressing the kind of material conditions that underpin and act as a, a kind of gate to pleasure, connection, fulfillment, health, well-being, safety. So I think that you know we have to do a better job of being really clear about what the foundations for freedom are. Um, and that's collectively um, mitigating risk. Like a lot of things are risky. Eating is risky. Drinking water is risky. The things that you know create uh, the foundation for our biological well-being often carry risk simply because that's an extremely vulnerable process, right? But we can't just target uh, the, the kind of emotional or interpersonal reaction to one or another of those things. We have to think about what is the floor for the kind of freedom that we imagine with each other and like with ourselves. I think that one of the interesting things that I learned uh, working on the book is that hormones can change radically depending on your social situation and not hormones like adrenaline, hormones like testosterone. Um, these things are reactive and they, they kind of reflect your um, social reality internally and that creates changes in the body we kind of, I think, should embrace the metaphor under there, right? Like there is an optimal type of healthy society that, that in turn affects our biology and affects our relationships with each other. Um, and so I would say like, in addition to lovingly embracing and supporting the decisions your friends make and their choices and so on and so forth um, and destigmatizing these things, we need to focus on the foundation because it doesn't matter if we live in a world where everybody can proudly say they get an, got an abortion if you have um, unequal access to insurance or unequal access to clinics or providers. And, you know, obviously, you see that kind of inequality get um, aggravated depending on other factors. So if you're a, a disabled person, then you are encountering structures that are constantly, constantly changing the outcomes of your life, right? Even just there's been a lot of discussion over about how COVID was great. It allowed people to take walks. There was kind of this like escape from work for certain people. If they weren't essential workers, you can garden, so on and so forth. That doesn't apply to everybody, right? The same is true with sexual freedom. It may not be the case that every person can just, you know, practice radical self-acceptance and then have access to the things that they want particularly when those things are uh, medical services or cost money currently. So I think we have to be like really strict with ourselves um, about the conditions for collective freedom and for, um, and what that means, you know, at, at every level of experience, I think. So I have to sign off for this evening and I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa Borst of N plus one who is going to moderate some audience questions. And I see that we've already got a couple of really exciting ones. Um, so keep them coming in the chat and thank you so much for writing such thought provoking materials and I wish everybody an evening of pleasure. Thank you. Thanks Natalie. Um, hi, uh, this has been great so far. Thank you guys so much. Um, 
we just got a question that I think uh, sort of pivots nicely um, off of what you were just saying, Ariel. Uh, Ariella, which is from Vicky Osterville, great, <laughs> great writer, um, who's, who's, who asks, in the pandemic, um, a lot of people have really reinvestigated their relationships to their own bodies, their genders, um, their traumas, as well as uh, erotics. Um, so many people have remarked, oh no, am I frozen? Um, so uh, she, uh, many people have remarked on how intense it is to even be in the same room with someone or to hug a friend. Um, how can we try to take the grief about the last year and a half of erotics, um, as well as lessons of the pandemic we've learned about ourselves and try to apply those to the production of infrastructures of communal pleasure and belonging? I think that's a great question. Maybe Sophie, can I call on you? Yeah, me too. I think about this quite a bit. I think that, um, oh, <laughs> sorry. Oh, I mean, I think I, uh, you should finish your sentence. I'll jump in. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, well, you know, I've been looking at a lot of alternative modes of city planning, right, or community planning. And people have been tackling this question long before the pandemic, which is great, right? And, and it depends on the degree to which it's taken seriously um, and the degree to which it's turned into something that's politically actionable. But... I think that it's revealed a lot. Um, you know, it's it seems odd in America to talk about states um, intervening in people's sex lives, but they literally do it all the time, constantly, to one or another degrees of success. So when Liza was talking about like leaving work to have sex, you can do that in Japan if if they think it'll lead to a child, right? But there are state interventions, um, particularly around population, but sometimes around pleasure. So you see this a lot in the Netherlands um, yeah. or around connectivity. You see this in Vienna, um, creating spaces that are actually accessible for everybody and that create certain types of accountability within the interaction. So like a brightly lit public space that has like a little enclave where you could have an intimate moment that's sem semi-visible. Um, it, it changes the stakes of those interpersonal interactions. So I think that, you know, the pandemic has highlighted the just unbelievably unsustainable inequality and brutality of American life. And for a lot of people, that means housing insecurity or housing loss. That means um, the loss of health care or, you know, not having had access to that at all. It's very clear the link there between this and, and other types of connection. If you live in a society, if you live in a community where people are underinsured, there are higher rates of sexually transmitted infections. That changes your sex life. We have sex with each other sometimes. Sometimes we have it alone our health is central to the way that we experience it. So I think that, you know, the lesson for the left is um, we have a, a, a country now that may be psychologically on the same page with a lot of these things as, as we have been and as leftist thinkers, communists and socialist thinkers have been. And we have to make sure we like, don't lose that headline, I think. And uh, the institutions that we need to push for are things we need anyway. Infrastructure, housing, we need um, childcare, we need spaces that are safe, we need a reinvestment in public space. So, you know, if we're theorizing around this or even in the position to take action around it, we need to make sure that we don't lose the, um, importance of the kind of regulatory power of social, and, um, private and public space and the dysregulatory power of it. And we need to make sure that we're balancing that um, and trying to have like a humanist approach to, uh, and a biological approach to the structures that we build. All right, sorry, Sophie. <laughs> that was great um hi that's very related um was you know um 
what where is this er erotophobia uh, um, on the left and um, your question sort of echoes that but I I think uh, you know what I take from your work very much is 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 the importance unfortunately um, unfortunately of resisting the idea that there is you know uh, one left you know false um, sort of unity is, is, is just as damaging as um, sort of uh, factionalism for the, for the, for the sake of, of factionalism, right? You know, but which, which left quite genuinely, you know, that there are quite different projects um, at stake, you know, for, for uh, you know, between a, a left that would abolish um, the family, <laughs> you know, that would, that would uh, you know, abolish time, <laughs> And, and a, a left that is actually uh, quite honestly um, only ultimately interested in a, um, a social democratic reconfiguration of existing kind of mores in which we have better childcare, perhaps, you know, and sex for women uh, remains better, uh, becomes better um, under this socialism. Um, but the you know, to, to an absence of uh, an improvement of um, leisure time, you know, which are all great, you know, it's fine as a direction, but I do think that there is a, a pretty big chasm between those for whom, um, you know, intermediary kind of uh, locations uh, like, uh, I don't know, Scandinavia or somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> which is such a, you know, um, there are lots of problems with that, um, with positioning that as an intermediary anyway, um, to do with eugenics and uh, white nationalism and uh, colonialism and all kinds of things. But, you know, th th there is also, I think, a, a super, you know, a, a strong, um, uh, ableist, um, horophobic, uh, femphobic kind of contingent on the left and it comes from or is at least a service of private property. They are also um, they, um, uh, activist productivity. <laughs> you know, this is a this is a real challenge. You know that there are uh, modes of organizing um, against capitalism that very much kind of reproduce and replicate. Um, uh, notions of sort of uh, productivist, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, value, which which are kind of structurally queer phobic. If you really want to, with Chris Chitty, for example, hold on to an idea of the queer as not so much about, um, you know, orientations and and uh, and even practices, um, uh, so much as uh, you know, insurgency against property <laughs> and against the state. Um, so, you know, that if it, I would say, I, you know, I, I, I was thinking of this earlier, and it might seem a bit left field, but um, virginity is a fascist concept, right? And, and, and I, I'm not saying that, you know, it is talked about explicitly on the left very much, but I, I do think that in a context where we have QAnon and um, sort of sex trafficking panics um, and the rise of uh, new kinds of swerf and new kinds of formations against um, trans life and uh, sort of moral panics about the uh, sexuality of the, the figure of the trans child, right? That we need to be extremely clear that these things are connected and that being sort of um, uh, in any sense uh, morally opposed to promiscuity is 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 playing into the hands of, of our enemies, right? Uh, we should congratulate people who have been, um, you know, uh, so lucky as to as to be home wreckers in a sense, right? We should not like. I, I guess this is very polemical. I'm sorry, um, but you know, the, the maybe we could reclaim the idea of the home wrecker, right? Like as a family abolitionist thing, perhaps couples. Um, and uh, are not something that we should 
we should defend, right? Perhaps the order and the, the physical um, sort of uh, propriety of the couple form is not something that we should naturalize, right? So, you know, so, so yeah, disability liberation, the, the, um, the liberation of, of sluts and, and, and literal sex workers and porn workers um, and those for whom it is too much to cater to, right? The, the, for those whose desires and needs are uh, not easy to meet, right? Those are the people who need to be at the at the at the core of a kind of sexual liberationist uh, po politics. Yeah, I think a really interesting part of Liza's essay um, is this kind of like Bolshevik formulation of of how the couple fits into the the movement um, and whether sometimes like a uh, you know, a monogamous arrangement is like antithetical to, to being part of a group. Um, I don't know if you want to speak more to that, but, but I was really like fascinated by it. Yeah, um, I mean, it, she, it, it was, it, 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 that was, that's one of the um, aspects of her work that I think is most, um, just, just sort of most, most profound and most ahead of her time in the sense that, um, you know that that we can we can really still read that and recognize that as something that we're just nowhere near addressing. You know, um, you know. So, um, you know, she she writes ab about how the um, the ideal of um, of you know bourgeois romantic love um, is, is you know is is that the the couple is isolated from the collective. And you know, whereas you know, in um, where whereas whereas communist love should bring you into the collective and um, and and indeed be, um, be, um, be that it it sh it should actually um, be um, secondary to the collective to to the collective eros, and. Um, and I th uh, one of the things I, I loved um, about her discussion of that was she talks about how, um, you know, over time, um, the, um, the ruling class had always been able to um, use Eros and romance in its own, uh, you know, to its own advantage. So, you know, and, and that's so true. I mean, you know, I, I read a lot of 19th century novels and the romance is always advancing the property interests of the elite. Oh, like, like that, like that's the whole drama, you know, how will the romance and the property, um, you know, interests be resolved or, or will they be resolved in, in you know, and ideally, ideally they are. Um, and, um, and, you know, and, you know, or similarly, um, or courtly love, you know, how like knights would do these great, you know, feats to um, win the lady and, you know that would sort of advance that, and and you know and and Colin Ty argues you know the um, that you know um, communist love needs to advance um, um, the collective. You know we like we need to we 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 need we need to socialize um, that passion, and you know and so it's not it's not that she's saying that. Um, you know, you wouldn't have individual romance, or you wouldn't have, you know, literal sex, you know, under communism, um, but that those things would be better, because you would have the material conditions, um, you know, to, to pursue them in a better way. Um, but they, they would also be less important, because you would, um, because you would be um, cared for and care for others um, in this collective way, um, and I think that that's um, I, I think that's really, you know, not all of her ideas have aged very well, but I think that one um, really I think that's a really profound one. Oh, and speaking of ideas that have not aged very well, I was thinking about this when um, when <laughs> when Jim Sophie was speaking. So um, um, so um, you know, horror phobia. Um, the um, Kalantai and the Bolshevik, Bolsheviks um, were very against um, prostitution, sex work, um, and um, and one of the reasons um, was um, interesting. Uh, one of the reasons was um, they felt women should be in the factories working. You know, so it was very explicitly, 
you know, that um, they saw it as, they saw prostitution as a resistance, as a resistance to quote unquote legitimate work, um, you know, and, uh, and it's not articulated in the same way in our, you know, modern um, capitalist culture. Um, but, um, but I think that that, um, that is sort of a, a fascinating um, window into, you know, where we can go, you know, where we can go wrong with um, um, in, in our materialist thinking, you know, that like, or, or where you can go wrong in not imagining uh, not reimagining work more fully, not re not reimagining you know sexuality more fully. Won't I also advocated for like multiple paternity, right? Yeah, mm, yeah, yeah, and that was actually a really necessary um, and um, and and important reform, mm -hmm. right? Um, that um, that 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 children would not suffer from um, from um, having you know, from being born outside of a, a an official marriage. Mm -hmm. um, if I may, um, I think this is a super sort of relevant, I think, to so many of our threads kind of point lies there and, and area. And um, I, I guess I would say that Colin Ty on, on um, prostitution is a really um, yeah, which is the flip side of um, the regime of sort of um, sexual compulsion and, and mm -hmm. which is the, the compulsion that to, to prescribe um, a, a kind of ethic and spirituality of sex, right? But this is equally, this is the um, equally to be fought, right? The, 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 the whore phobic notion um, that sex should be this kind of healthful, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, anything, right? Commun, you know, whatever. Like mm -hmm. that, that is equally a thing to be resisted. And I know that there's a question in the chat about um, uh, a sort of dissatisfaction um, with an opposition, a too simplistic opposition between work and pleasure. And I was thinking about this as I was listening to you both. And um, <laughs> sorry, Lisa, I'm kind of, you know. Uh, auto uh uh you know hosting here <laughs> facilitating but you know um it, it strikes me that the yeah there is something about maybe the choice of terminology here that that and and pleasure is perhaps not the right term um because there is a pleasure in work right uh perversely right this is the thing that wages for housework was i think often very good at expressing that many of the activities that fulfill our desires, um, such as spending time with children, spending time with um, husbands, you know, um, cooking, <laughs> um, these things sometimes are, are hugely rewarding and joyful and shall we say pleasurable, but they are also work, right? When they, sorry, I just keep saying this over and over again in every event, but you know, they say it is love, we say it is unwaged work is not a contradiction. They right. don't say it's not love. They say it is work as well, right? That's the clincher, that's the problem. That's the thing we have to understand that so much um, about capitalism runs through our, our, our liberatory um, activity, right? It, it like, a, like, a, like a thread and we don't, we don't know how um, always, you know, to, to, to extricate to kind of fill it out that thread and liberate ourselves from the work character um, of things that we might also preserve right abolition means simultaneous preservation and destruction right real families against the family because paradoxically the arts of care and joy are often um, developed um, you know, it, it, uh, both in and on the peripheries of of these uh, um, scarcity producing um, and sort of uh, austerity kind of infrastructures of social reproduction, right? The private isolated households that the pandemic have also revealed to us um, are both very kind of uh, fictive, right? You know, households are not really um, uh, bounded autonomous organisms. There's all kind of labor um, that flows through the walls of each um, bubbled 
uh, nuclear family, private household. Um, and at the same time, it's a very meaningful fiction. It's a very kind of um, affecting and powerful um, sort of fiction, right? And so I think paradoxically, um, sorry, you know, Vicky's question and Sarah Leonard's question, I read them um, one after the other and I got them mixed up. <laughs> so sorry about that. Uh, kind of one of them was about the left and one of them was more about what we do in this moment of grief um, to, to try and um, heal together. And I, I would say that, you know, paradoxically, and this is optimistic, I'm always optimistic, but you know, the, the, the distance that we have felt from one another um, is, is, is actually, it's inseparable from a closeness we have also felt, right? The, 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 the reason we have had to learn how to um, uh, enact vapor containing techniques like masking up and keeping a six foot distance from other human bodies in certain spaces is, is because we care <laughs> about yeah. one another and we have become very palpably aware of our leakiness and our um, constitutive porosity yeah. and we have perhaps collectively gained the ability to distinguish between um, a, a, a bottom-up collective um, instantiation of boundarying and regulation and uh, a, 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 um, a collective intelligence around risk and policing, right? There, there's a huge difference um, between policing and boundarying. Um, and, and, and that is, you know, that is, I think, the, the conversation, to answer your question, Vicky, that needs to, to happen. We need to grieve together. There is death everywhere. We have experienced so much death and I sometimes feel like we don't know how to talk about it we, we you know we first grief <laughs> you know and and then um and then a sense you know i guess to 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 flag my concept amniotechnics which it's a it's the end of the event sorry but you know at colin Ty, talking about sex as drinking a glass of water and the octopus being kind of simultaneously a flood and a reservoir and literally a sort of sign for um, <laughs> boundarying and its tenuousness. I would say the octopuses are almost like a representation of uh, formlessness and viscera um, and almost genitalia <laughs> and touch and slime. They, they literally sort of are, um, you know, boundaries incarnate, <laughs> like in all of their tenuousness. And so, that this kind of wateriness, right, is exactly, I think, what for me we have been talking about for an hour and a half now. It's because what I call amniotechnics is this kind of art of both being in water, protecting water, and defending oneself and others against water sort of at the same time. <laughs> um, sort of holding and caring and boundarying even while being ripped into, which is kind of what happens in gestating, which. Uh, um, you know, some of us here present have experience of, right, this kind of deep mutuality and messiness, which I think is also not conducive to simple leftist slogans, unfortunately, right, because it's kind of difficult to make demands that are, that, that are around messy and kinky kinds of desires, um, you know, like we, we, we sort of want to vindicate things or we want to, you know, um, uh, reject them, you know, but so much, so much of life is unfortunately kind of weirder than that, right? Like it's, it's, and that's not a very satisfying note to end on, but I will shut up. Um, no, that was amazing. I do think we should probably wind down, um, if that's all right. Although I could really listen to you all speak forever. Um, this has been like really expansive and, and interesting, um, and, uh, kind of sexy. Um, so thank you all so much, um, and thanks to everyone who came, and, and, and sorry to everybody who asked. These are, there's all these amazing questions that we didn't get to. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I really, really appreciate this. Um, everyone should read Lux, read N plus One, uh, read the work of our panelists, um, and truly thank, thank you guys so much. Um, I'm going to turn it off, but uh, have a great evening. Thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.